Hello and welcome to yet another interesting conversation from our series of Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bulbaka. I'm coming to you from the Mosaic Work Studios and my guest today is somebody who has done a lot of work in the past years to evolve the practices in software development and to teach these practices to many people. Um, he has been part of a few very interesting uh, things that came up in, in recent years, more programming, uh, uh, approval testing, and uh, uh, other ways of teaching and doing remote pairing with developers and doing all kinds of teaching activities. And uh, we will have a very interesting chat today, I'm very sure. Uh, welcome, Lou. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. Okay, so your name is Llewellyn Falco, but uh, everybody yeah. calls you Lou because it's a, I know you say it's a difficult <laughs> it's name to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, the, I have the same problem with my second name, so I, I kind of get it. <laughs> um, so um, before we start, what I like to do with every guest is to ask, um, uh, a bit about your biography and why, what made you get into programming? Why did you start writing code or going to a university or whatever you did to, to get where you are now? So I have like an odd combination of parents, right? So my, my dad was a professor of fluid dynamics. So it's sort of like the way laminar flow goes and the way liquids and gases move over objects. He is extremely in love with computers, right? Like he, he loves technology. Uh, we had a computer at a very early age. Um, he's not great with computers, right? But, but he really, really loves them. Uh, my mother is also very mathematical. Um, she, she came up in the genetics world. Uh, she's actually a game inventor. She created a card game called Set. Um, and she was a programmer, right? Like she, she, she never really liked computers, uh, but she was very good with them. It's an odd combination. So my dad loves them, not that great with them. Mom, really good with them, didn't really like them. Uh, but as a side effect, um, they started sort of a side business uh, doing medical, like nursing homes software uh, in the 80s. So we had like a, a Vax PDD-11 mainframe in our house, like growing up, um, before like before PCs were really common, like we had this like I mean it was, I mean it was like a filing cabinet, massive thing. I remember when we got our first hundred megabyte disc, which was like a platter that you would hold, and like put into like there's a drawer that would come out and you'd put it in. So so we had this in our house, and then like, you know, in the same way as your parents would like pay you to do chores and stuff, they would like. Part of my allowance was like writing up little, uh, well, Fortran programs, right? And it was just one of those things. And then um, when PCs started to come out, we had like an IBM clone. And you know, a lot of times like we would do gaming, but gaming back in the really beginning of PCs was usually basic, right? So you had these basic games that you, you could download. When we started downloading them, that was before we had BB. Sees. So I, I guess you just like find shareware, like discs that would pass around from friend to friend. But but the code would actually be there, right? Like, so you, you would have this game, like, you know, the first one I remember was like tanks where you could like aim the tank, but you could actually like open up the code and like change the code and like hack at the game. Um, and so, you know, you just would. Um, and so programming was just one of those skills that I had, but it wasn't something I ever really considered like, uh, like something to do, you know, it's sort of like, you know, I can cook, but I'm, like, I'm not thinking about being a chef, right? But I can make my own food. And it was just one of those things, like I, I could use the computer. Uh, when BBCs came out, like before the internet was here, we used to use our phones to dial in to other computers. Uh, and, and, you know, like, I would go on BBCs and check out stuff there. And then you could, like, 
download the thing and try to host your own BBC, which like was not practical. It's not like you could tie up your phone line, but like it was just fun to sort of like play around with it. Um, and it wasn't until sort of in college or I, I was there, I really like math. I really like physics. I was going to college for physics. And you would start to get these ideas of things you wanted to create. And computers are a place where you can create stuff in a way that you cannot in the rest of the world. Right? Like, if you're like, oh, I'm curious about making a car. Like, even today, right? And here we are, like, many, many years later from when I was in college. But, like, I mean, that's like, you need permission. You need someone who's going to give you money in a team and like, like you just can't go and do it. But that's not true on a computer. Like if you have an idea of something you want to create in software, you don't need anybody's permission. You can just go and do it. You can just go and create it. You can just like, you know, code is free, right? It costs your time. It costs your effort. There's a lot of frustration that you're going to pay. But like, as long as you have the computer itself, like everything else is, is free. Um, and so early on, when I started to get ideas of things that I kind of wish existed and I wanted to create, computers were just like a natural play space where I could create something and I didn't need someone else's permission. I did like I could just go and do it. And I was never that great at getting other people's permission. <laughs> so <laughs> this was a huge advantage for me. And that that's sort of where we started. Like, you know, I remember my first idea, like just getting really, really excited in a way that I, I, I've never really been that excited to create something or, or to do anything before, before I like, but now when I do get ideas, like I can just go and create them. And then one of the things like to this day that has been super valuable to me has been uh, being able to move very quickly when I get excited about an idea, right? So I took an idea from a, a book from DHH and David Truman, uh, Fried, I'm misremembering the guy's name, but the people who did Ruby on Rails um, have a book called Rework. And in there, they have this, like, the whole book is like a bunch of like one page chapters, basically. Um, but they have this one part where they talk about inspiration being like a peach. Like, like you go to the store and you get a really ripe peach and it's like, you need to eat that thing soon because tomorrow it's going to be rotten, <laughs> right? But right now it's delicious. And and it's the same sort of rule of like, if I get excited about an idea, I try to get a version one out in eight hours, right? And because in that first eight hours, you can do magic. And it it, it strikes at weird times. Like it's not... It's not like a, an odd, it's, it's not like something you can just be like, okay, I'm excited about an idea. Like you just have to recognize that for whatever reason you are excited about the idea right now, and then you need to make space for it. And because I have like a lot of people who follow me on Twitter and connections through LinkedIn and, and just a lot of people I've paired with in general, right? So like, um, I can usually, if I get excited about an idea, just sort of post and say who's available right now and, and find someone to pair with. And usually together we can get something not great, but I mean something that works out in eight hours. And that's, that's really amazing. And then you can spend a lot of time afterwards polishing it and getting it to something that is like maybe more presentable. But if you can get something out the door right away and so that that whole thing of being able to create has a wonderful like going back to where it started i remember i was my dad so i mentioned he was a college professor and so he had his own laboratory all right so there's this building sort of at the edge of campus that he had where they would do these experiments and stuff and one weekend he, he brought me out there and I don't know why he brought me, like, I didn't have anything to do. So, like, he was in the back, like, putting together tanks and, you know, dyes and lasers and stuff and whatever. And I was just stuck in the office and I was just bored, right? Like, really, really bored. 
And so I'm playing on this computer, and then he doesn't have games on his computer because it's a like work computer at a university. Uh, so <laughs> what I did is I wrote like my first virus, right? Which was not a, not a real virus, but just it, and with the way that like uh, DOS would boot up in, in the old days, it would first run this like it was like auto run dot bat, and it was just a it was just a bat script. And so what I did is I went into it and modified it so that it would clear the whole screen and then print, do you have a virus? And then wait until you pressed any key. And it was, it was like three lines of code. Uh, and I just did it because I was really bored. And it wasn't until like, you know, Monday or Tuesday, it was like a couple days later when he had forgot, when I get this call from dad in a panic. <laughs> and he was like, Llewellyn, what have you done on my computer? <laughs> but at the time, it was a great feeling, right? Because you know, when you're like ten years old, it's it's a kind of power. But it is a that is like I've paid for that day many many times over because now my dad is paranoid about viruses, and I am the de facto like tech support for my family, <laughs> and so. For like decades after that, I am still like paying the price of my dad being paranoid about viruses. Yeah. So this this brings me to uh, you mentioned a few things that are interesting. So you started with Fortran, right? Yeah. So yeah. Do you think that influenced the way you write code or the way you structure your code later? So. I don't think Fortran did. Basic, I remember when we got to, um, it was either basic or quick basic, um, was the first time I got uh, really introduced to, to subroutines, right? Like to go sub. And at the time, I didn't have the mental structure of like, let's break things into pieces that are functional and return, like, like mechanicalistically. But what I did have is it was really, really hard for me um, to keep in my head more than one page of code. And so I would put things into go subs just so that I could keep each like a section of one page at a time. And that that was really helpful. Later on, I remember like, so then we moved to Pascal because like, my high school had a programming course, but it was in Pascal, so I went to Pascal. Um, and then when we were in Borland Pascal, and I remember getting Microsoft Quick Pascal, and that was the first time in my life that I had color syntax highlighting in code. And that was like, that was world changing. And in fact, I remember because there was a bug I was trying to figure out, and when I opened it up in in quick pascal half the screen was green and green green of course being comments i had forgotten the the end comment and so all this code i thought was executing was not executing <laughs> and like um like that has really helped because for me like there are programmers out there who are i don't want to say good because their code is always really buggy but they are competent and they are able to work in these extremely long methods, right? Like hundreds of lines, thousands of lines. And I am unable to function in it. It was like never a skill I was able to do. I just can't, I can't handle very large amounts of things. And so I, I remember sort of just being in awe that they could, in awe that they could function in the code. But for me, because I can't, function in that code, I had to come up with a lot of skills to, to not like, like to change code. So it didn't look that way. Right. Like I, I came up with a lot of skills. Of like, how do I get code into very small manageable pieces? Because even slightly large pieces are too much for me to handle. <laughs> like I just can't function. I feel to this day, like I, I'm really good at taking a very large piece of code and and sectioning it up without understanding until it's into small pieces that I can understand. But I still don't have the skills to actually function in a large method. 
Like I just cannot read 200 lines of code and make heads or tails of what it actually does, right? Like I need to figure out ways to pull it out. So I'm curious, does this relate also to the things that you read or to reading, or is just about reading code uh, that makes you, makes you dizzy when you see large pieces? Um, yeah, I don't do well with like contracts, right? <laughs> like any that like lawyers write, I, I like it really is a struggle for me. And a lot of times I have to sort of like, like if, if, if there's a contract I'm reading that I actually really need to care about, I'll have to like sort of like highlight sections and then write like three or four words of this means this. This means that like I have to chunk it into things that I can actually understand. Otherwise, I, I just can't function. In terms of like literature and stuff, um, I mean, the weird thing is like, I don't do that much reading, reading, like I, I actually really enjoy books. Um, so I listen to a whole bunch of books, uh, but, and, and I, <laughs> I used to, I did a gig a long time ago for a company called Columbia house. Um, and, and they actually sold like records and albums. And so I got a whole bunch of audio books from them. I also, uh, I dated a librarian for, for quite a while. Um, and so. Uh, they also introduced me to audiobooks, and I remember when I when I first started listening to a whole bunch of book. One of the things I really like about books, like like literature books, is as opposed to like TV or movie or even like radio, is it is it's long, right? Like a book is you know three hundred four hundred pages, like a thousand pages. Like they have time to go into the details in a way that like a movie won't. And so, and so I actually really do like that, but I do need ways to sort of chunk it into consumable pieces. That's also like a phenomenon that just like, recently we were watching um, The Queen's Gambit mm. on Netflix, which I've, I also read that book. Uh, I read it back in like 2000, right? Uh, and I remember really, really liking the book. So when it came out on Netflix, I was like, oh yeah, we should check that out. And I love that they did it as you know, a single series, like a single things. We saw that also with um, Amazon just did a, oh, what was that? The Terry Pratchett uh, and Neil Gaiman. Um, uh, American Gods or? Uh, not the American no. Gods, the, uh, 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 yeah. the Angels. I forget the, the name. Um, but, but again, like we're starting to see where like, you can tell a longer story more richly. So I, I do like the, I like, I like having it in nice consumable chunks, but I also like that, that long form of like, like of, of getting into the details. And, and it's a similar thing to the code, right? Like where it's, you go into the details in, in chunks. What I like a lot less is something that sort of occurs in like soap operas where it's like there's like seven stories and they're just all intertwining and, and, and like i that I, I i find a lot more like it's just like i'm, I'm having to keep track of too many things mm. right or is this like i want to keep just one thing at a time i also i i dislike um like watching multiple things at the same time oh. right so, or, or reading like two books at once, like I hate that, right? Like I just like, give me the one book, let me consume it, then I'll pick another one. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So you, you mentioned college, but you didn't mention what, uh, what you did in college. What was the, <laughs> because I assume it, it was not about programming based on what you said. Yeah, so pretty much not. Uh, I first I went to college for physics. Um, I I did that. I also like I, I really really like math, and so I went through literally every math course that was offered. And then um, I dropped out and moved out. I was going to college in Maryland. I moved back to Arizona, which my parents had moved from Michigan to Arizona. Um, and I was still trying to figure out what to do. And then I went back to college for chemical engineering. 
uh, because I was like, the thing about physics is like physics is, is really fun, right? At the lower levels. And then, um, because it's like, physics was like, there are rules to how the world works. And let me tell you what they are. And at the time, in like up until that point, you're like, what are the rules to the world? Like you have no idea that there even are rules. And it, it's just the world does certain things and it's all magic. And then all of a sudden you get to physics and you're like, wait, it's not magic. There are rules. You can, you can like, there. it's like a game almost. Um, but then they get kind of get to the edge of the rules and they're like, okay, that's all we know. Um, and we don't know how to teach you to discover the new rules. So we're going to teach you how to get a job. And, and the worst thing about physics is like, it's, it's a great place if you love physics, but it's an absolutely horrible place if you want a job, right? Like it's just, uh, so, so it's just, it, it just doesn't make sense at that point. It becomes a lot less fun. And so then I was like, well, if I'm going to get a job, chemical engineering seemed like a good place to get a job. Uh, so, so I transferred over to that. Um, and then, and then I just got really excited about ideas. And then I just dropped out again to create stuff because it was so much more exciting to be with computers than anything else I had, had done. Uh, I did take a C++ course in college and that, so I took a, a, pa, or a Pascal course in high school that got me off of basic. I, I took a basic course actually too. <laughs> so like a summer school growing up in middle school. So that got me into basic and then a Pascal course got me into Pascal and then a C++ course got me into C++. And then my first uh, actual job got me into Java. Um, although I had, um, I mentioned my mother was a game designer. So when Java first came out, we actually thought like, <laughs> it was like 95. Like we thought that Java was going to be the way you interacted with things on the internet. Like the way websites would be interactive. That turned out not to be the case. <laughs> but um, that, I, that did get me introduced to Java in the beginning. And it was very much like C++. So it wasn't that hard to, to move to. Um, and I wrote like some small applets. Um, and then, and then when I got my first job, like that's where I really started to learn Java. And then it was, oh yeah. Wow. So, uh, I was working for a company out in Cambridge. They did like medical, uh, biotech and I had, I'd written an, an ORM effectively. Right? Like this is before we had ORMs that you would just use. Um, so I wrote a whole thing that would take our objects and store them to the database and read them from the database and turn them into objects. And, um, and then there was this middle layer that was done by, by this large medical company. And then we also worked on the front end. So we, we were the way back end and the way front end. And the team that worked on the front end was like, we want to use the stuff you wrote, but we don't understand it. And so I went up and I met this guy, Steve Delio, Delio and um, I sat in his office for like a week and it was a long week. I think we did like a hundred hours that week. Uh, but I just basically, I sat in the chair and I'd be like, you need to do this. And he'd be like, and he'd open up his code and do it. And he'd be like, but how do you do that? And I'm like, oh, you need to do this. And, and we effectively paired for a week and it was amazing. Like I had never been so productive for so long. And that, that thing when you're programming and you just get into that state of flow and time sort of just speeds by and you just like, that happened almost like solid for a week. Um, and it was really, really good. We rewrote like three quarters of an application in a week. I mean, it was, it was just amazing. Um, and. And I thought for a long time, it just, it was Steve. Like Steve is a great guy. I still, Steve's still a great guy. But for the longest time I thought, wow, I really like working with Steve. I hope I get to work with Steve again. Um, but then I'd moved back to San Diego and I was working by myself in my own company. And it was just basically me. And I was just lonely. Like I, I just, 
you know, like when you're working at a company, you get to talk to other people about programming, but you can't talk to normal people about programming because they just look at you like, huh? And so, so I just sort of lonely. And so um, I, I went and looked for the Java user group, right? Like I was just looking online, like, hey, are there, are there things that people me up? And, and I found uh, the San Diego Java user group. And so I started going there once a month just so I could like talk about programming to other human beings. And the, the leader of that group, Paul, was a, was a great guy. And um, San Diego gets, the California gets a lot of fires. Right, so uh, one year, uh, this would be like 2003, we got this huge fire and Paul's house burned down, uh, but his garage did not burn down, right? So he had like a, a house and a garage that were separate and they weren't that far away, but for some reason the house completely burned to the ground, garage did not. And so he's like, holy crap, I, I need to move into my garage. <laughs> so he like sent a, a thing out to the list and said, hey, can can you help me? you know, empty out my garage so, and get it into storage so that I have a place to sleep at night. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so we went out and we're spending the, you know, the weekend helping him get his garage into a place that he could actually move into. And um, while we're doing that, I picked up this book. It was just like, you know, I'm picking up a whole bunch of Star Trek stuff and just a whole, a whole bunch of random stuff he had. Uh, and, and moving it into storage. And I picked up this book that said Pair Programming uh, by Laurie Williams. And I was like, what's this? And he starts telling me about like how it worked. They do extreme programming. And one of the ways they work is by pairing. And he's describing this thing that me and Steve had. And I just, be, I remember being like, like I loved working with Steve. And I was like, are you telling me that I can have this experience that I had with Steve with other people. Like, I want that. I love that experience. I, I want that feeling. I want, I want that back. And so he's like, yeah, yeah. Take the book, read the book. So I, I took the book and I, I, I took it on. I read it really quickly at the time. Like I said, I had one employee, right? So it was me and uh, Lars Lane, it was me and Lane. And, um, so right away, it's like, yeah, let's start doing that. And of course, the, the plus side is when you're when you're paying someone, um, you can just say you're going to work in a certain way, and they'll do it. Like that's a that's a super side effect. Um, and so that started my pairing. And I I apparently misunderstood what Lori was writing about. Um, but when she talked about driver navigator, I interpreted it very literally that like. You know, the person at the keyboard is the person typing and the navigator is the person instructing. And and that's sort of where strong style programming came from, strong style pairing. Um, I didn't know it was different. It didn't occur to me that it wasn't what other people were doing uh, until almost seven years later when I was at my first conference. And I started pairing that way and other people were like, what the hell are you doing? Right, like at the time, like people were just like, this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't what pairing is. Um, but to me, it was exactly what pairing was because I had done it basically 40 hours a week for, for seven years that way. Like that's how we programmed uh, for all of the development we did with Facilitate. And, and, it, and you know, at the beginning, it was, it was hard on people and abrasive and I didn't understand. Like I was used to pairing in a situation where I was the boss anyways and we already had trust established. And so I didn't, you know, I, when I would pair with new people, I didn't yet understand like how to do that in a, a way that wasn't so abrasive. Uh, but you know, through lots of mistakes, have you figured that out? Um, and then eventually it got a name, which also really helped. Like it's amazing the power of names, right? To take yeah. this like weird thing, all of a sudden it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. So going back a little bit, because you mentioned um, switching to C++, and I imagine, yeah. that, was that your first uh, touch of object-oriented programming? And how, how did you get into this paradigm? Yeah, so, I mean, I definitely remember CRC cards. Um, I think they were taught in college, um, and they were definitely used in like my first jobs 
Uh, up at that point, I didn't, I didn't learn about test-driven development until much later. Uh, the first time it was really introduced to me at all, like I remember um, at one point reading about this thing called extreme programming and unit test. And my thought was, oh yeah, I test, I test pieces of my code. I do unit testing. Like it didn't occur to me that yeah, but no, that's not at all what they mean. Um, and then, and then I went to an interview um, at ThoughtWorks uh, up there, and I remember they had mentioned uh, this concept of automated test and, and unit testing, and and I didn't end up going to ThoughtWorks, but I, I that idea stuck with me, and, and I was doing a, some web stuff. And I, I couldn't figure out how to do, like, like I wasn't doing unit testing at that point, but what I did take to heart was sort of semi-automatic testing. So I started writing a lot of code that like, like when I was on a page would instantiate the whole page for me, right? Or, you know, like start running, like starting to automate the testing process. Um, and that, that is the first time where like the thinking of code more as a craft really started to emerge up until that point it was just let's architect things right like architects like people we always thought about let's plan stuff out that felt like really natural right and so object oriented code like that came just from the, the crc cards and trying to like architect to up refactoring and like actually letting code emerge that didn't come until until we first had the test and then the pairing the pairing helped a lot right because everybody has has things they know that you don't know and and i just would learn so much from pairing and then i really liked that san diego user group and so someone was like, oh, you should come to the XP user group. Uh, and so I did. And I remember like my first user group there, this guy was talking uh, and he made this statement about, he, he was working at, I think he was working at at and I, I could be totally wrong about that. Um, but he was like, when I got here, there was 50,000 lines of code. And in a year, I was able to get it down to 30,000 lines of code. And I think I could have gotten it down to 25 in, in the end. And I had never, I never heard anybody talk about removing code and definitely not talk about removing code as a point of pride, as a accomplishment, right? Like that was the first time this idea ever, ever came to me. Um, and so I was, I was, I was just, I was just blown away that like how that could be a thing that making things simpler could be, could be a thing. And so, and then the, another thing that was amazing about the XP user group is June Clark. Um, she sort of was like the runner of the group, right? And June is like a just a lovely person, but also very sociable. And so she would always do like dinners afterwards and make sure like we would actually like talk. And so unlike like at the user group, like we'd get together, but mainly we would like eat the pizza and listen to the lecture. But at the XP user group, we really talked and met other people. Like at the XP group is where I met Carl. It's where I met Woody Zool. Uh, that's where I met Jason Kearney. Like these are relationships that have like throughout my life just benefited me so much. Like these, like, and, and not just knowing these people, but like actually interacting with these people, building stuff, discovering stuff. Um, that is, that has been amazing. And, and so that just also sort of like that collaboration is where the design skills came out of. Right. So more than like going to school or reading a book, it's working with other brilliant people and not working near other brilliant people, like working with 
be in the same room on the same computer, do something together. That's where that, that knowledge started to evolve uh, with Carl, uh, with Carl and XP, we started doing Monday night code, which is once a week, this is, you know, in the before times, but, uh, once a week we'd get together for like two to three hours and we would just do programming for fun. I learned so much from those sessions. Like, and, and we, in the beginning, we tried to make them productive. We actually like adopted an open source project and tried, but that just sucked. It was, it was just like doing work, right? Like, and so we stopped doing that and they were like, the only rule is whatever we do today is for fun. And that was amazing. Like so much good stuff came out of that. Approval tests came out of that. Um, yeah, like one day I was like, hey, we should be able to figure out file names from like reflection through Java. And yeah, like we could. Like that opened the whole thing of saying like, hey, I can I can take a snapshot and save it to a file because I know what the name is. Um and, and like so much good stuff just came out of playing with code on top of just enjoying work, right? Because of course we got into code because we love code, but once you start doing it as a job, it becomes a bit of a job. And, and playing with code once a week reminded me how much I love code. It reminded me that this, was, this wasn't just a job, it was something I enjoyed. Um, and then, you know, in the beginning, especially it'd be like Monday, you would play with code and you'd be like, oh, this is awesome. And then like Tuesday, you're like, oh, code's awesome. And Wednesday, you're like, yeah, code, code's good. And Thursday, you're like, oh, I enjoy coding. And Friday, you're like, um, it's sort of just the code again. And then Monday, we come around again, and you'd be like, oh, yeah, code is awesome. <laughs> and so it's like every week, you'd get this little, little shot of like, yeah, you enjoy the thing you do. And, and so, and again, like we learned so much from that. And that going to the user group, and then connecting with people there and doing things together in collaboration like that has been so valuable. And then, you know, from the pairing there to mobbing, like, and then from, from mobbing, we got to uh, remote pairing, which the advantage of remote pairing was you could, you can spend time with people that you just can't like right now in pandemic, everything's remote, right? But even with that, I have people that I really, really care about, all right, that I consider good friends that I have never met in person, right? Like you forget that you haven't met them in person because you've spent so much time with them, <laughs> right? Um, but like, there's no way that I could I could collaborate with these people if. I was restricted by the physical world, but because you can do remote pairing, you get this chance to work with people on something that like, maybe there is only like, like what, there's 8 billion people in the world. Right. But I, you know, even in like, you know, in the U S with 300 million people, I'm not sure I have another person that is that interested in C plus plus approval tests. Right. But Claire is out in England and she is interested and, and, it doesn't matter how many people aren't interested. It only matters that you find the person that is. Right. And so, so there's so many places where as soon as I started, you know, speaking at conferences and, and doing podcasts, people who are interested were able to find me. And the only thing that matters is that we get to connect. Right. Like, and so, I have a few people across the globe that I, I pair with regularly on on open source projects or just stuff that we enjoy. And even in the pandemic, we've started doing remote mobbing, right? So we have like a Twitch mob that gets together every other Saturday and we do like two hours of C sharp and, and we just live stream it, right? And that's been great. Like we are learning and discovering new things that haven't seen before there. Um, I pair with Claire once or twice a week in C++. I pair with Lars out in Estonia on the Java. I pair with Simon on uh, C-sharp approvals. Like it's, 
that ability to connect with other people and everybody brings things that are unique and different and that you don't know. And a lot of times that you don't know, you don't know, right? Like you can't even Google for these things because you can't go to Google and say, tell me something interesting that I don't know. <laughs> like <laughs> that search doesn't come back <laughs> useful. All right. So, um, and you mentioned the pandemic times now. Um, what have you been doing in terms of business uh, endeavors? Uh, what are you doing now? Just to kind of end your biography and then go into the, the topics. Yeah. So before the pandemic, I, I had a sort of strange life. Like I would do a third of my time, I'd go to conferences. A third of my time, I would do paid work as an agile technical coach. So I'd go to companies uh, two weeks at a time and we'd sit with the team and we'd program together, learn to program together better. Uh, and then a third of my time, I would do open source uh, and I'd play video games. Um, so, and that, that was like a really good balance of my life. Like it worked really well. Um, I do a similar thing here. The numbers have gotten shifted. Open source has gone way up. Um, so I've, I've done a lot more open source since the pandemic. Um, I still do a lot of remote coaching, but, or coaching, it is now remote, which uh, that took some learning how to do i no longer will do a full day remote um it's just exhausting it just doesn't work very well um i don't know why it's so much harder to do it remote than in person like i have competing ideas i think part of it is remote requires a lot more effort than in person right because you're trying to pick up things that you don't get you know, like, like things you get for free when you're actually in the room, uh, you don't get. But the other thing I think is when when you are doing it in person, you know, you travel to the city and, and like the rest of your life stops. It just halts for two weeks while you're working with this client. Uh, whereas here, the rest of your life is going on like in the next room and it's like, hey, hey, I'm here, I'm here. And so that might be why it's exhausting, but either way it is. And so with teams I've been doing, uh, where before I would do three teams a day in a learning hour, now I'm doing one team uh, for two hours plus a learning hour. So it's half days. Um, but it turns out like it's still working pretty well. We've learned how to mob remotely now, which took some getting used to. Um, a lot of it, so, Figuring out like how to set up video and screens. We do, uh, when we're mobbing remotely, we're either using multiple screens, like two screens on a computer, uh, or we're using, so like, I have an iPad right here and a little phone holder. And very often my Zoom call is actually not on the nice microphone and camera, but just on the iPad. And share screen is happening on the actual computer. Mm. Um, and different reasons for that like sometimes vpn alone is a reason like it just takes way too much bandwidth uh also we are using a lot of ec2 servers um so rather than everybody going onto one person's machine which can be really overwhelming to that like internet connection and upload uh we will throw up the machine in the cloud and then everybody goes to the cloud and now we're going to Amazon, we're using Amazon's bandwidth. That works a lot, lot better. Um, and, you know, if one of us has like, if our internet drops, not a problem. Everyone else is able to continue until we come back online, right? Um, we've, been, we've been using a lot of PowerShell scripts. So if you are doing a server on Amazon, it's either Linux or Windows. They just started making Mac available last week, I think. Um, I still haven't gotten a chance to actually play with the, the Mac mini EC2 servers. They're not virtual servers. They're, they're actual hardware. You can like, you can grab a Mac for now. Um, but that is actually quite, quite interesting. Um, but so most of the time we're doing Windows servers uh, because as a developer environment, Windows is pretty great. Um, and we use PowerShell script shells. So we have these PowerShell shell scripts that use like chocolatey, which is like AppKit or Home uh, Brew, if you if you use that on that, and a single line of code, and we'll just be like, 
boom, load this, and the machine will go from zero to completely set up to your development environment, usually in about 20 minutes. And then we'll use that machine for like a week or two, and then we'll just destroy the machine. Right. And so this idea that we can just spin up machines and, and tear them down and the idea of like uh, cattle, not pets, but for your dev environment, not your production environment, has been really, really useful. So uh, to go back to uh, more programming, because this was one of your yeah. contributions and uh, it's interesting to see uh, where it came from. So how how did you arrive with this idea? I know it was a collaboration, but I don't know exactly <laughs> who contributed what no, or sorry. how this emerged in the group. Uh, and uh, so how did you get here? How did you start doing that? So it was, it was sort of an interesting thing. Um, in 2009, I went to the Agile 2009 conference. I really, really wanted to present on approval testing. So I created approval test in 2008. And, and then I was like, I want to share it. Uh, and Agile seemed like the place I'd never been to the conference before, but I worked very hard on my submission. Um, and and like so we got accepted. And so we went there. And that conference was a it was actually a very hard conference for me. Like, like I didn't I thought like these are my people. I'm gonna fit in perfectly. Uh, and it, it was it was a hard it was a hard, it was a hard <laughs> transition. Uh, we got there in the end. But but that conference was very hard. And so I had signed up for something called Programming with the Stars. So like I was paired with JB Rainsberger. And uh, every day we would try to create like this little three to five minute performance, which was also like exhausting. Um, and there was a whole agile thing and giving my first talk at a, a national conference. Um, but I was also going to all the other talks because like first time going in, I want to see everything. And I stumbled into this talk, which was actually really small. It was like for the agile plague where a lot of the talks were like 50, 100 people in a room. This was like maybe 10 people. Um, but it was, oh, I can't believe I'm blinking on his name. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, a, a guy out of Paris, um, who wrote the leprechauns of software book. And he was there showing us how to do the Paris coding dojo style, right? With Randall. And so I went to that, uh, thing and. The problem was every time, like they, they weren't doing strong style pairing. They were doing regular pairing. So whoever was at the keyboard would sort of go in a direction for about like four minutes and then they would rotate and a whole new person would go in a completely different direction and often like delete the other person's code because you couldn't finish anything in four minutes. And I saw this in a media as like, you just use, need to use like, my style of pairing. Now, again, it didn't have a name for my style of pairing, but I was just like, the problem is the person at the keyboard is thinking. Like that was so clear to me. And so, so I saw this and it was really interesting. And I went back to Woody and Carl and I was like, hey, I saw this thing. I think we should try it. We just need to modify it so the person at the keyboard isn't thinking. And Carl Manister, uh, who, it's <laughs> maybe like one of the bravest people I know. Uh, so he early on had said, you know, the thing about extreme programming is we are exploring and discovering things. But whenever anyone gives a talk, it's always like they've done it before. Like it's always pre-planned. You never get to see someone explore. We should do a talk where we take a suggestion from the audience and we just program it live in front of them. And I was like, Carl, you are crazy. Like, there's no way we're going to do that. Like, that's not happening. That's a disaster of a talk. Uh, but, and, and so we didn't do that because that, that was crazy. Um, but we started doing Monday Night Code. And after about a year or two of Monday Night Code, I looked at Carl and I was like, I still think that idea is crazy. But there will never be a better time that we are prepared for it. Like, this is the best we will ever do at it. We've been pairing together now for two years. We understand each other. We've done lots of problems. Like, like this is the best we will ever do at this. So we might as well do it. So we went to a code camp, which is like a local organization. 
And we started doing these sessions where we would just take someone in the audience, give us a program, we will program it up for you live. And, and, and those were really neat and fun sessions. And so when I discovered this thing at Agile 2009, we came back and I was like, we should do those sessions, but instead of us doing it, we should have the whole group do it. And Woody immediately was like, yes, because Woody used to be a banjo player. Like um, Woody in his childhood toured the US playing banjo professionally with his brother, right? Like, and, and so uh, he, he was like, when I, when I was a musician, we would go to these festivals and at the end of the festival at the night, there'd be a campfire and there'd be all these people around the campfire playing music together. Right. And it would sort of be like the really good people were at the middle of the campfire and like the worse you were, the more at the edge you were, like maybe on the side. Um, but he's like, we would play music together and we go to all these things with programming, but we never program together. We need to program. We need the same thing I had, you know, at the music festivals, at the programming festivals. And so we started doing this exercise where like we just have we literally ask people like what are some things we could program and people would just shout out stuff right like checkers or clothes chooser or wine chooser or whatever they just shout out stuff and then we just vote hey which one do we, which one do people like and who, whichever one they chose so like if, if the answer was like we're gonna play uh we're gonna play like bocce ball right like then whoever suggested bocce ball, they were the product owner, right? So like you suggested it, you're going to tell us what the, what the stories are. And then we would, we just program together and we'd rotate really quickly. Uh, often in the beginning, we rotated really quickly just because we had so many people, like we'd come, there'd be like 20 people and you had like two hours. And so like, you got to rotate quickly. Um, and and then we do it strong style. So like if you're at the keyboard, you no know thinking was allowed. And and we'll just call Randori strong style. Like we do our coding dojos and we did a lot of these. And uh, they were super fun. And we learned a lot about code and a lot about each other. And we just really enjoyed the sessions. We did a ton of them. Um, and we never thought it was a way to do production code. Like that was just not, but it was a great way to learn. Like it was a really good way to learn. And, and so uh, I started using it when I would teach classes because I was working for a company called Developmenter. Uh, we also started up teaching kids programming around this time. And, and so we'd use it for teaching sometimes like in the classes because it was just better. And sometimes out of utter necessity. Like I remember we were going to do pair programming uh, in Zambia where I was living out there for a month. Uh, working on a project called Smart Care. It was like a medical record project. And so uh, Lynn and I were out there volunteering on it. And Lynn was an evangelist. So she is super good at like convincing people to do stuff. And uh, she showed up to the girls' school, which we were going to teach at. And instead of talking about code or programming or anything related to software, she stands up, she throws on her sunglasses, and she's like, I'm Lynn, I'm a programmer, and I'm from Hollywood. And... <laughs> The next day, instead of like the 20 girls we were supposed to get, there are 60 girls. And we go into their computer lab to set up the computers, and we could get like four of them working out of the 20. So we're like, this, there's no way this is going to work. So I opened my laptop. Lynn opened her laptop. We put them on the projector. I took 30 girls. She took 30 girls. And we just, we would, we just mob with them. Again, we didn't have the word at the time. It was just, we were doing Randori. And then Woody got a job at a company and, and the, he got a job from someone who really trusted him, didn't really understand things, but, but it was sort of like the stuff I've been trying with my teams hasn't been working. The stuff you're doing sounds crazy, but like, I, I'm desperate, like, let's try something. And Woody was like, I will do this, but on the condition that for two years, you don't get to tell me how to run the team. The team gets to discover it ourselves. And the guy was like, he was just, he was like, okay, like, 
I'm willing to take that risk. And so Woody would do every Friday, they would get together and they would practice, like practice Fridays. And very often he would do it in this drunk style randori because that's this, this, this method that we found that was so good at, at teaching things, right? And then one day there's this project that they were dreading doing, right? Where it's just like, you know, that it's like my taxes, like I hate my taxes, right? And so very often it's the last day that taxes are due that I start doing my taxes, right? Like I just put it off because I don't want to deal with it. And there was this project they had that was the same way. They just, they put it off. And then all of a sudden it's like, I can't put it off anymore. We need to do this. And, and so they're like, well, let's, let's treat it like a practice problem. Like they were used to doing these katas, uh, these practice problems in, on Friday. So they did it like that. And it, it worked, it, lo- it worked well. And the thing that's amazing about Woody is almost everyone else in the planet when something when something happens they are willing to try something new like in times of desperation you're willing to try something new but the moment that they get out of that they go back to the way they they did things before so i've heard people all the time say oh yeah we had this time where there's like this huge bug and we put the code up on the on the conference room and we all worked together and it was great and we got it solved and I'm like, oh, what did you do right after that? Well, we went back to working like normal. <laughs> but Woody was like, hey, that worked. Let's do more of it. Um, and so like Woody also is a big believer as I am in retrospectives. And so they just started like basically from that moment on, they kept working that way. And, and the thing about like a regular job <laughs> is that like, you have time right like this is something as a coach i'm super jealous of right because change takes time and so but you have time at a regular job and so very quickly you know it's like hey i heard about this thing and then like you know you talk to woody like again and like two weeks have passed and you talk to him again and like two weeks have passed and all of a sudden it's a month that they've been doing this style of programming every day and in a month a lot of really exciting things that occurred. And all of a sudden we start to realize, hey, maybe this thing that we were only using as like a way of practicing might be a way of doing things in the real world. And, and that was a whole opening up of that. And then, um, and then like, Woody did this thing where he brought his entire team to a conference. It was an open space in San Diego. And we just started talking about it and, and why it's working. And through talking to other people, we started to discover like sort of what, you know, again, this is those things where it's like a lot of times you don't realize your own things until you get in front of other people. You start talking to other people and people are like, oh, I had similar experiences or why did that work? And you start actually like discovering for yourself why these things are actually happening, why they're actually working. And so so that's where where it came from. And then it just like it's so much fun to do. You learn so much. I mentioned like I got into basic because I took a class in my middle school. Basic. And I got into Pascal because I took a class. Right. But uh, once I started pairing and mobbing, I have so many languages, like approval tests. An interesting thing about approval tests over open source libraries uh, is most open source libraries are developed in a single language. And if the concept is good, they get ported to other languages, but not usually by the person who developed it. Because I pair, approval tests is in like 13 different languages. And, and I've been part of them, right? Like I remember I got an email from somebody just sort of randomly saying like, Hey, I've been doing a lot of work in Go. I'm curious about moving approval tests to Go. Would you like, you know, would you like it to come back to the official project? And I was like, Hey, like, yes. And hell yes. Like, do you want to work together on it? And so we paired like two hours a day for 10 days till we finished that project, right? Like, and it, released it and good. And 
okay, maybe I could have figured out ghost syntax, but there's no way I could have figured out like idiomatic go or go culture or like, I just couldn't, do, I couldn't do that. Same with like with C++, like I can usually make something work in C++, but when I'm working with Claire, like the most common thing she will say to me is, that's not how you do it in C++, right? Like, like I still don't really understand idiomatic C++, right? Like there's a whole culture there that takes, you know, a long time to really understand. So by being able to move with other people, not only do I get the syntax, which is usually pretty quick to adapt, uh, but you also get the culture, which is, is much harder to understand. And yeah, and so like, I get to work with teams and languages I, I hadn't heard of before. And then two weeks later, like I'm passable in that language. Like that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, the sounds uh, so. Uh, Adi gave me the name of, uh, just to clarify, the first talk that you've been to that inspired all this was by Laurent Bosavit. Mm. Yes, but there's another... Who did the Leprechauns of Software? <laughs> I think it was him. Um, uh, software. Yeah. Lawrence, uh, Laurent, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, Laurent Brosavi. Okay. Um, so you mentioned about uh, uh, more programming and how how uh, it developed, kind of, and it's, yeah. it's very interesting to hear. Now, another question is, why do you think it works? What, what makes it work? I have a theory, but uh, I'd like to hear so, what you say as well, and then... Okay about it but my overall theory right now is that like we are in an industry where optimizing learning is the way you optimize developing and and so i think in the end it's really just you know like they did that study at google right um the academia study the i don't know they did a study of teams right because google has a lot of teams and google loves data and patterns and what they were trying to figure out like what makes a, a highly productive team. And basically they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so they, they, they went and they got more data and they started adding in social norms. And when they did that, all of a sudden there's this huge correlation that the teams where everybody is contributing, those are the teams that are doing really well. Right. And that makes sense. If you think of this as group intelligence, as opposed to individual intelligence, right? Because very often you are, you're going in, in opposite directions, right? And your team, even though like there's a lot of powerful people, they're not going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. If you can get them all going in the same direction, it becomes really powerful, right? And there, there's this book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And basically all of those dysfunctions are impossible in a mob, right? Like it's, you can't optimize for an individual when you're all working together. Like it, it, it's just not possible, right? And, and so there's a whole bunch of things where it's just like, if we can get everybody contributing and trying, and one of the things that's really interesting about a mob is the willingness to try new things, right? Like if you think about it, just, this is true in a group in general, right? Like if you, if you are going to lunch, like let's go to the before times when we used to go to restaurants. So if you're going to lunch, like you have like one or two restaurants around your work and you go there all the time, or maybe you go to the work cafeteria, but either way you're going there all the time. You meet up with a person, right? And you're like, Hey, where should we go to lunch? There's a decent chance you're going to recommend a place you haven't been to before, right? And if you get a group of people together, there's a really good chance you're going to start seeing all these different restaurants. There's this, this amazing book, um, Richard Wiseman, called uh, The Luck Factor, right? So Richard Wiseman is a, a cognitive scientist out in Europe, uh, somewhere in England. And he has been studying scientifically luck, right? And he found like four things that make people lucky, like make lucky people lucky. And a big one is 
they just literally like if you think about it like like winning the lotto lucky people have a tendency to just buy more tickets right <laughs> and so I, like the corollary to that in like life is they go to more places they meet more people they they have more chances to be lucky so like like i mentioned i, I recently moved here to los alamos and i i've been doing virtual walks right so i have this friend uh jan mcdonald down in san diego we used to go to walks together all the time and now of course i don't live in san diego so we can't do that so what we do is like once or twice a week we take a walk and we do a phone call. And so she's walking in San Diego, I'm walking here, and we're just sort of taking a walk together. And then we use a rule that I, it's been really helpful in the pandemic, but generally helpful is whenever we're done with whatever, like with our walk, we schedule our next walk. So there always is the next one on the calendar. Even if it's like, you know, three weeks away, there's always the next one on the calendar. And that's been really, really helpful. I do that with pairing a lot. I do that with not like, mm. I just make it so that whatever the next thing is, it's on the calendar. So it happens eventually, right? Because if you don't have it on the calendar, then like a year goes by and you're like, holy shit, what happened? Um, so, so we do these walks and my rule, and I got this from the luck factor is I just try not to walk the same path twice. Right. So every time I go, I'm like, OK, how can I go someplace in the city I haven't been before? And as a side effect, I've gotten to discover a lot of the city. Right. Um, and, you know, every time you take a new path, there's something to discover that you hadn't seen before. Right. And it's, you know, if I had done the exact same walks, but just doing the same route, I would have never discovered these things. Right. So. By trying new things, you get a chance. And right, a lot of times, a lot of the places I go are not that interesting. Right, but there's usually something interesting somewhere. Somewhere along the path, I'm going to find something that's interesting. And so, um, I think with mobbing, there's a similar thing where they get used to trying new things. Right, so like the teams I had that are mobbing versus not mobbing. The amount of technology they experience is just huge. They are just trying so many more things. And, and very often they're discarding them. They're like, yeah, you know, that seemed like it's good, but let me tell you what the problems are, right? Because when you actually use something, a lot of stuff is not nearly as good as advertising. Mm. But they do know what the good things are. And a lot of times they'll take something that's like, oh, I really like the way this worked. You know, I like the way this worked in Spark. We're using fire hose at the moment, but it, we're taking that technique. That was really good, right? So they, they keep collecting these really useful things. And I think that's like a big part of it is just if you're learning stuff at a good rate, you are going to outperform the teams that aren't. Yeah. I think that's uh, why it works. So that's, I think that's part of it. Uh... I can definitely recognize, and it's very interesting that you compare it to walking and basically with building a map because it's it's yeah. kind of like building a map of things that you can do and work and don't work. That's another thing, right? Like if you work by yourself, if you have five people on the team, you're going to see just this little part of the software. But if the whole team works on it, you're going to see the whole software. Yeah, you're right. You build a map. And not only that, but also a map of techniques, a map of, you know, it's it's much more complex than that. Absolutely. And, and this links a lot with the things that I've learned recently about cognitive science and uh, how kind of maps are built into the brain because we were navigating all the time, right? It, it was important to know the map <laughs> around your, your area uh, when you are a, a primitive man. And then you can fundamentally look at how we deal with uh, complex things today in terms of maps and uh, because this it makes sense the same mechanisms were used in the brain to evolve in different uh, for different things and so yeah of... i mean agile was the first place where the concept that the 
that we are people who build software and therefore paying attention to how people work might be useful in software. But you're right, like our brains are set to work in certain patterns and working in those patterns helps. Yeah. I also yeah. have a, a, an alternate theory kind of looking from another lens because uh, it's always yeah. useful to look from multiple lenses. I started writing uh, a year ago a book on software engineering, which I didn't finish because, uh, well, my publisher didn't want to wait as long as it needed to <laughs> for this to be written. <laughs> I estimated it at about three to five years. <laughs> it might have been quite long. Uh, but one interesting thing that I kept thinking about was, okay, so if you think about software development in terms of engineering, you need to look at, um, at the systems that are there and so on. And one thing yeah. that I've been looking at is, okay, so if you look at the system as a software development team, as a system, fundamentally you have an input which is unrefined knowledge because fundamentally you get some requirements, some wishes, some desires, some whatever. And then at the end, you need to turn this into very refined, precise knowledge that you encode. Yeah. And it has to be very precise because the computer needs to run it and computer cannot deal with imprecision and, and so on. So fundamentally, <laughs> yeah. what you have in the middle, the, the development team complete, like everybody taking, uh, you, taking uh, some role in this, uh, 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 endeavor is, is a develop is a, a knowledge refinery and then if you think about this in terms of refining knowledge then it makes sense that when you have multiple groups of people either pairing or mobbing or they are able at refining knowledge faster than well they refine the knowledge faster and they refine it period right there's a lot of things where it's like I might have a good idea, but no ability to execute that good idea. And when, when I have that good idea by myself, it dies. But if I have that good idea in the team, well, maybe Kate knows how to refine that idea and make it something, or maybe Kate knows how to refine it a little bit, and that's as far as she can go. But once it's refined to that level, well, then Sam, knows how to take it and refine it one place more. And I see that happen a lot in the group where before, before I did mob programming, there are people who are, they're really good at executing ideas. Like they're just good at taking an idea and turning it from concept to reality. And I used to think that those were the only people who had good ideas. And not only I thought they had the best ideas and, and they had ideas period. And what I realized in mobbing is, A, they, they don't have the best ideas, and they usually don't even have, like, like they don't even have that good ideas. Like, they're people who have really good ideas. They just, they were always dying. Like, I never saw the results of those good ideas, so I never thought they were good ideas. But other people would be like, oh, no, wait, let's try this. But no idea how to do it. Like, just no idea how to do it. Um, once those ideas start growing, right? Like, so you, you, that refinement where it's like, I have an idea, it's really horrible. And then like we start refining and refining until it's something that's a real gem. A lot of times those things were just dying on the side. Like they, they never got a chance to grow. Yeah. Um, absolutely, I think that's part of it. But I also think of that as part of learning too. Yeah. Right? Like, because once you do that once or twice, now the whole team knows how to do it. And now we can start refining more advanced things. Yeah, yeah indeed. Yeah. And it's a multiple loop process fundamentally happening at multiple yeah. levels. So, um, well, and that's definitely a thing with mobbing is the power of mobbing a team that has mobbed like for a week versus a team that is mobbed for like, you know, 10 weeks is not producing one tenth, right? Like, it snowballs, right? At 10 weeks, you are doing way, way more than you are doing at one week because that, you know, that snowball just grows exponentially. 
So my first experience with more programming has been a disaster <laughs> because we've done it. <laughs> we've done it in a context where there were multiple uh, uh, opinionated people, which I like, but still <laughs> we were all very opinionated yeah. and didn't quite uh, catch the the. Um, uh, the way to do facilitation, we didn't have a facilitator, there were, there were multiple problems there. And then I did a mob session with you and that, was, that showed me how, how good it can be. But this leads oh, me to you. a question which is, um, what are the prerequisites for starting mob programming in a work environment? Because for fun, okay, yeah. it's a self-selecting group, you go there, you want to have fun, you want to try things. But you go in a work environment, these are a bit more different contexts. Much different. Um, so, yeah, so first, I think it's really good to acknowledge that at a conference or a place like that, you do have a self selecting group, and that does make a big difference. Um, the, also, I think it's good to mention the facilitator, right? So, having a facilitator is really valuable uh, in a mob. And and it, even if you just have someone from the team say, today I'm going to be the facilitator, that that is useful, right? You can rotate who that person is, but have somebody who's looking at the bigger picture and just sort of saying, is everything working okay? Um, there's, there's the practical prerequisites, right? Like you need a place to do it. You need, so if, if you're going to do it, uh, like at work, make a way that you can actually rotate people through. Uh, one thing we have been doing in places like if you can't do it like an Amazon server is we've made one person type the entire time. It's like maybe you're sharing your screen on Zoom. And, and the rule is like basically you don't get to think the entire session. And then tomorrow we'll switch, like we'll have Adi type and Adi doesn't get to think. And then the next day I'll type and I don't get to think and like so we are keeping like a single driver but we're still rotating the people who are navigating uh, rotate quickly that's the thing I see people do the two things they do wrong the most is the person at the keyboard is thinking that it is horrible now you're just watching someone work and uh, you rotate too quickly like you're rotating every 10 minutes every 20 minutes every half hour that's just horrible too because it's too long. Like it's too long before you get to participate again. Um, but the other thing is like, in, in Katrina Owen, who uh, is, is fantastic. She uh, is the one who created Exorcism IO. Uh, we actually met very early on at a mob uh, in Southern California, uh, where one of the first things I remember is she used Dvorak and I used Dvorak. That's like a bonding experience. <laughs> so, um, so she has a saying that she got from someone who's like, the most important thing about practice is that you want to practice tomorrow. So if you're gonna do it at work, like that goes like a hundredfold, right? Like, because these are people that you are going to be with, like nothing you do today is gonna be as important as the fact that you keep doing this. And I see teams who will like, they'll try mobbing like once a month, right? But like, I would much rather that you do mobbing once a day, even if it, like, if you're doing one day, <laughs> this, this gets hard, but like, I'd rather you do like 20 minutes of mobbing once a day than like a week of mobbing at the end of the month. Like do a little bit each time and try to make it good. Try to make it a good experience spend time on the retro you mentioned like having that map a lot of times it's in the retrospective at the end of a mobbing session where the group actually is creating the map right where they're seeing the patterns or they're seeing like like they're creating their map um and and, and make it like don't make it too long because if you're too tired you don't want to do it tomorrow uh don't make it too hard like I see teams that come and they're like, we want to try mobbing. Oh, and there's this thing that we've never been able to do. Maybe we should start with that. And it's like, you don't start the video game on expert level. You start on the beginner level, like do something easy, do something easier. 
be successful learning because it's going to be hard enough to learn how to talk to each other hard enough to learn how to listen to each other that can be really difficult um it, it's just l listening to each other especially in a team where you have history like so when we did teaching kids programming we would pair people together all the time like that's how we worked our kids right two kids at a computer because it just made a better learning experience and the rule that we had because uh you know most of the time we're doing classes but sometimes we do just open classes where you know just sort of anyone can come and so sometimes we get parents coming with their kids uh and they'd be like no no i want to do it too and that would be like fine like we have no problem with teaching the parents to program that, that's all good but you're not allowed to pair with your own kids like so we would pair the grown-ups with other grown-ups and the kids with other kids right and if you like brothers and sisters came, you were not allowed to pair with your brother or sister, right? Because the history there is so strong that nothing we would do in a two hour course could change that dynamic. And so be aware that at work, there's a similar thing where there's existing dynamics. And so really try to make it like a space we can put those to the side as much as possible. And, and first of all, that's easier in a mob than it is in a pair. If you're pairing with your manager and your manager says, do something like you're just going to do it. Like that's sort of how that works in a group. At the very least, you have a chance that maybe we're not going to do like, so the rule for, for our mobs is if people want it, like if people have suggestions, we're going to do all of them. Right. So we will do what the manager says, but we're also going to do what the other people say. But then which one do we keep? Which one do we end up doing? That very much might not be what the manager says. Right. If the rest of the group is like, no, we like this better, that that power dynamic has ability to shift. Mm -hmm. So just be aware that this dynamic exists and, and try to make enough space where you can shift it. And if you start with them, something that is critical to the industry or critical to your business like that's a that's a version of a very hard problem it's going to be hard for that power dynamic to shift if you start with something that's trivial and easy okay well then it's not such a big deal that you know we did something that wasn't like if i'm the manager i'm like well you know whatever like i'm willing to lose this one it's not that important and then you get a chance to discover hey, maybe losing that one was a win in the end. Maybe trying something different, let me discover something new. So start easy, start simple, start with something that's not that important. Don't start with the really important, super hard thing. <laughs> Have you ever had a mob that kind of failed in the first hour or so? Uh, in the first hour, no, but but I have had a mob that like a full time mob that failed. Um, the the thing that might be very different for me is that I am always coming in in a position of privilege at a mob, right? So like a lot of times, like I talk to people who are like trying to get mobbing working at their company, right? And like it would be like weeks and weeks of them like setting stuff up because they don't have the same privilege where me it's like usually within the first four hours of me being at a company we've done two to three hours of mobbing right like because because like i'm coming in as an outside consultant like i have this extra privilege and yeah maybe like they won't continue it if i'm not there tomorrow but they will try it when i am there and so since i come in two weeks at a time at the end of two weeks We've had a fair amount of experience for them to make a decision about. Um, that that gives a lot of a lot of it just makes my job easier, right? So, um, but I had a team, uh, I had a team out in Florida where they were very productive. Uh, they were they were a mob. Once they started mobbing, they were they, their productivity just skyrocketed. Um, but they weren't that nice to each other. And it, it took about six to eight months 
but then the team just fell apart because they just, even though they were crazy productive, they just, they didn't really like working together because they, they weren't very nice to each other. <laughs> um, there's this, these working agreements of kindness, consideration, and respect, and you really need those to be in place. Otherwise, it's just not sustainable. Right? Um, it just, nobody wants to be unhappy at work. Yeah. And I imagine, uh, I mean, I, I guess it matters a lot about the history of the team and if they have trust in each other and if they, uh, uh, or at least yeah. if they, they are on a blank slate and they are just forming and then it's easier. But, but if they have a long history of distrusting each other or not liking to work with each other, I imagine mobs could go quite, quite wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's weird because there's a lot of places that don't have trust. Um, that's com that's more common than, than abnormal in a company, but that's different than like having mistrust, right? Like it's, there's one thing to say like, I don't trust you because I've never really had a chance to establish trust versus I actively distrust you. You've betrayed me many times in the past. <laughs> like that's a different situation. <laughs> Have you ever had like people uh, who had a pet idea or a pet thing they were just pushing and pushing and pushing in, in the mob? <laughs> because I guess that's another thing that I've seen as a group dynamic sometimes. So I've seen that. I, I don't get it as much in the mob. I'm a fairly strong facilitator. Mm -hmm. So that part is usually not so much of a problem. Like we can try stuff out. Did we like it? Did we not? Like, go ahead. But um, the what I have seen and what I have experienced is I'm working with a team, and while we're in the mob, they're doing stuff. But the moment they go away from the mob, they revert mm. to their old being. Um, and the first thing is like the smaller the mob the more like the smaller the mob, the more you're dealing with individuals. And so the more likely that is to happen, uh, the bigger the mob, the more likely you're, you're dealing with a team and a group. And so it's actually less likely to happen. But the other thing I've had is people who they're just too busy to join the mob. <laughs> It seems like every single day there's some other thing coming up that they're too busy to do it today. Um, if you don't show up, it doesn't work. Like, I think that's true in life. This idea like 90% of success is just showing up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've seen this uh, as well. Okay, so... Um... There are there are much more things that we could discuss about more programming, but I think it's it's enough in terms of setting up what more programming is and what are some caveats that would be interesting for our audience. So I like to switch yeah, to. Right if you've never seen it before, come check out the Twitch channel. Um, but even better, just try it with your teams. Like this is one of those things that until you experience it. It just doesn't it doesn't work quite the same. Yeah, and I can say the first time I heard this, it sounded crazy. And uh, I actually heard yeah. it from a team that was doing it full time in uh, in Sweden, and uh, <laughs> it was quite interesting to to hear that it worked. And uh, but like like other crazy things for me, it was the co retreat which sounded crazy, and then we did them, and it was like <laughs> such an amazing well, experience. Yeah. So some of these things that sound crazy are worth worth trying out because uh, I mean the, the worst thing that can happen is you'll spend one hour, you won't like it, and then you'll forget about it. So <laughs> one of the things that's really interesting about people is we are not very good at distinguishing between a bad idea and a great idea if it's new right like if it's if it's something we've experienced before 
right? If it's not new, we're really, we're pretty good at that. Like we're like, oh no, I've had something like that. But if it's not something we've experienced, we're actually remarkably bad at that. And, and there's a whole bunch of examples of this throughout history. The one that sticks out in my mind the most is the Mary, Mary Tyler Moore show. Seinfeld actually was the same way. Like the first season, it was very unpopular. Mary Tyler Moore was really unpopular. And then one of the more popular shows, you know, in television. Um, just because it was so different. People are not good at recognizing something that's great if it's different. Because again, in the end, like we have monkey brains. Like <laughs> it could be better, but they're monkey brains. <laughs> yeah, and it's useful to uh, to form a skill of separating what is not familiar from what is yeah. actually something that you've tried and you know it won't work and so on. But if something is not familiar, you don't know. Separate. I have an opinion on something I've tried versus I have an opinion on something I haven't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, you mentioned approval testing a number of times. And this is another one of your contributions that's gaining <laughs> steam in the recent years, particularly with the yeah. more and more need for techniques for legacy code. So can you tell us a bit about where did the approval testing come from and how does it work? Yeah. So this approval testing came from like a couple different things. One is um, I, I had a tendency even from early on to write my tests whereas like from a slightly higher, so more on the BDD side. And if you are on the BDD side, you very often end up with like, like, let's say like, for example, you're, you're testing a receipt and be like, well, I want to buy, you know, I want to buy these things and then I get a receipt, right? Or you're doing accounting and you're like, I do these transactions and I want to see the bank statement, right? Or like, there's very often you end up with the thing you want to verify does not, it's not a number. It's not two numbers, it's like, a, it's an object. I want to verify this object. And, and that just is something that's very difficult to do with normal asserts. Because normal asserts are very much like, check that five equals five, or check that, you know, Smith equals Smith. It's not, check that this object is the way I want it to be. And so, uh, very early, what I I used a lot of two strings. I would just I would I would take my objects, I'd turn them into a, some kind of two string, and then I would just sort of copy and paste that two string into the equals, and it works, but it's just it's so clunky. And then um, I so I I've been on a Mac for a while, but I, I grew up on PCs, and there was a program on PCs called Slick Run, which was an amazing little program. It was, it was a really, it was a small program. It made a little thing that just sat in the corner of your screen and you could, you could hit a keyboard to go to it. It's a lot like a uh, spotlight is on a Mac nowadays, right? You like, you hit the keyboard thing and then you type the program and it would just open the program. And if you could customize it, like you could make, you know, so I, I'd be like morning and it would open my web browser to these pages and, you know, open my calendar and check my email and just all, you know, it, it was just a nice little launcher. And so because of Slick Run, when I, I, I was, I quickly started to appreciate this idea that I don't need to build everything in the world, but I do need to use other things that are built. I need to, I need to integrate them. And so when I started to have these long strings, I'd be like, I want to use diff tools so I can understand what the differences are in them. And so then I, I would be like, okay, instead of taking it, the string, let's read it from a file, right? So now I had these files. And so now I'd be like opening the diff tools to read the files. And then I was like, well, I can write something just like slick run to write, open those files for me. And that quickly became uh, writing, like a little piece of custom assert that would just say, 
compare the take this object, turn it into a string, and compare it to this file, right? And if it doesn't work, launch the reporter. And that was great. And but then I was like, the problem is I have to manage all these file names. It was just really cumbersome. Uh, so like I said at a Monday night, I was like, I think I can get it so that the file names are automatically created from the test names. And so Carl and I sort of explored that through reflection uh, to do it. And then, then we ended up with this really simple API that was just like verify an object. And it would take that object, turn it into a string, write it to a file, compare it against the file that you said was OK. Um, and then if it didn't fail, open a diff tool so you can see it. Um, it's been like, there's like a lot of different places that have done this concept, right? So proof of text, of course. Uh, Jeff did something called text test. Pearlfish is a library in Java. Uh, more recently, Facebook created uh, Jest, uh, which has popularized it a lot, right? Because Facebook and React are very popular. Um, so uh, I think they call it snapshot testing. Um, the the thing about it, though, at its core is you can now, you don't have to change your tests so that it's easy to test, like easy to verify. You can, you can write your test however you want so that you get back the thing you care about. And then it's just about, let me see that the thing I care about is in the correct state. That works really, really good for legacy code. You mentioned that because legacy code, changing legacy code is a nightmare, right? So it's nice to be able to say, well, before I change it, let me just see what it does and capture that to make sure it doesn't change. But it's also really nice when I'm when I'm doing test driven development because very often I want, you know, so like with Game of Life uh, from the code retreat, very often I'm like, okay, well I have a board and I want yeah, I want it to advance and now I want this board. And I want to I want to I want my test to show that my starting board moves to my ending board. And that is that's something that's hard to do if you're like, you know, even if you have like five squares, I have to check these five squares are all on. Do I check that the other squares are off? Like, but it's very easy to just print a board. And and now I can look at it. And so I can start thinking about my tests from what I want, not what is easy to test. And and that's really powerful. I also start um I think about how I am going to display my code a lot too. So we mentioned again maps, right? Very often I people don't take the time to to print their objects. So they don't have a good way of visualizing how does the data of my system look? And, and putting a little bit of design work into that to say, let me have a good way of visualizing data in my system allows you to start saying, let me visualize the way data flows through my system, uh, which is useful in many, many ways, especially in debugging. Because in debugging, the situation is, I have a mental model of how data flows through my system. And the computer has another model of how data flows through its system, and they are not in sync, right? So I think it should do this, but the computer thinks it should do this. And, and being able to see what the computer is actually doing makes it much easier for you to say, oh, this is where my map doesn't match the actual terrain. That's what I need to fix. Right. Most of the time I need to fix it by changing the terrain so it actually matches my map. But sometimes you need to change your map. Yeah, and I found the approval test to be very, very easy to use. And uh, as you mentioned, you wrote them in, uh, in many programming languages, pairing with people, also C++. Uh, that is super useful, yeah. But, but it's interesting that... Um, uh, so there, there are various styles of TDD, and we had this conversation before, but your yeah, style yeah. of TDD tends to go towards representation very fast. And there are other yeah, styles yeah. of TDD which 
don't go to representation. You actually delay representation until perhaps until the last moment. Very late. Uh, and, yeah. and that's where the approval test is limited. But of course, every tool has its limitation. No, no reason to. I, I tend to be a very visual thinker as well. Mm -hmm. So that might be why like this, this form of testing fits me very well. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that might, like, again, you mentioned sort of the way our brains work really informs what we, we like, how we like to think. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it's possible, like if, if your way of thinking is just different, it works, works, works for you. Yeah. And, uh, but one thing that I like is, uh, there's, so, you know, for, if you lose your luggage in a, in a yeah. plane, they don't ask you to describe fully your luggage. <laughs> they just show you pictures <laughs> and say, is this like this one? And what are the differences compared to this one? And to me, approval testing is kind of like that. Because yeah. you say, this is kind of what I want. And now perhaps I get a different result, but why are those different? Is this... <laughs> And it's much easier to reckon, like it's hard to describe your luggage, but it's easy to recognize, oh yeah, that's my luggage. Exactly. Right? And it's easy yeah. to recognize kind of a general shape and then to, to go into specifics. There's one another thing that I wanted to ask you about approval tests, which is something that I know you've been doing uh, the last time we talked, uh, which was uh, you started to write documentation in a specific way. Yes. And that was so a very is, interesting uh, experiment. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, I've been doing a lot of C++ approvals with Claire. And Claire cares about documentation. And I'm pairing with Claire. So her caring about documentation basically means I start caring about documentation. Um, and so we've started writing a lot of documentation. And Interestingly, I, we've been using a tool from Simon, who I also paired with quite a lot, but I actually never really wrote documentation with. Uh, but he wrote a tool called Markdown Snippets, which I love, which allows you to put basically a comment in your code with a label. And then in your Markdown, just say snippet colon label, and it goes to the code, gets it, and puts it into your Markdown. And that means that like, just like test-driven development, like if you ever had documentation where you copied the code and it didn't compile and it didn't work, like this stops that, right? Now your documentation is always up to date. It always compiles, it always works. And the way Markdown Snippets does it, it puts a link back. So you can have this like section of code that's nice and works in your documentation, but someone's like, I don't understand like what imports are they using or what, like. They can just click and go straight to the code. So, so we've been doing a lot of that. And one of the things that has been, like we've been doing enough of it that we actually now have a, for every feature we create, it's not done until it has documentation. So like we are writing a piece of documentation, it might just be a paragraph, but like we're writing a piece of documentation for every new feature. And the interesting thing about it is like, like when I started doing test-driven development, up until that point, I wrote a lot of code that was just not very nice to use, right? And it wasn't nice to use because I wasn't using it. And the moment I start doing TDD, I'm using my code. And I'm, if I don't like the way my code works, I change that code. Like I am very, very un, like, like I'm not okay writing using code that I don't like to use, right? Like I want to change that. Um, but the person who's using it, the, the, the idea of the person, the concept in TDD is always an expert. It's always someone who understands. The question is like, can an expert use this code well? And if you're doing TDD, the answer to that is almost always yes. An expert can do it well. When we started writing documentation, the, the persona is no longer an expert. It's no longer how do you use this code well. It's how do you learn to use this code well. And when you're writing that documentation, you're thinking about the beginner, who basically you don't think about at all in TDD. You think about the expert in TDD. So 
Another interesting thing is there's only one expert. Like, what's that saying? Like, every happy family looks the same, but miserable families are miserable in their own way. So there's lots of different types of beginners. And so you, you find yourself not even being able to write documentation just for a single person, right? You have to now write sort of a couple of different documentations because what if you're a beginner over here or you're a beginner over here? I need to show both of them what's the path to get to here. And so I just never even thought of these people before when I was writing code, like they, they didn't hit my mind. And so now I have to think about them when I write the documentation. And very often when I'm writing that documentation, I'm sort of saying, oh man, you're over there. Well, that path sucks. Here's, here's how you navigate that path. But the thing is, I hate, I hate writing that documentation. I hate writing documentation explaining why using my software sucks. <laughs> and so the moment I have to write that documentation, I am pretty much going to change my software so it doesn't suck. So that path doesn't suck. It's like, oh, you need to do these 10 steps. Probably I'm going to write something you're like, here's the one step you need to do, and it will do these 10 steps for you. Right? Um, and and so very often my code has been improved because of the documentation that we're writing. And in fact, I did this just recently with, let me see if I can find the, the piece. Um, so I was working with Lars out in Estonia on the, C, uh, on the Java version of approval test. And Emily Bach, who is an amazing programmer out of Sweden, um, she introduced me to a concept called pairwise testing. Uh, and the idea of pairwise testing is sort of an old concept from manual testing. And they realized that like in manual testing, doing lots and lots of combinations is hard. Like doing 150 tests is, is a deal breaker if you're a manual tester, right? Uh, whereas my computer can do that no problem. And so, uh, yeah. I'm trying to think like, what's a good way to share this? Um, what is a good way to share this? Do I share my screen or? What is it? It's a URL or a video or? Uh, you, can, yeah, URL. you could share your screen, yes. Right. Uh, let me do that. And that. And... Right. So, uh, so yeah, in, Emily introduced me to this pairwise testing. Uh, present now, a window uh, here. Yeah. And so we, we've been programming it up. And finally, when we're all done, and this is weeks later, we're like, we need to write the documentation. And so to write the documentation, we're like, we basically just wrote this one paragraph, like, hey, there's this thing called pairwise testing. And it dramatically reduces things, right? Uh, and so you can just change verify all combinations to verify best pairs. And then we're like, when we wrote that paragraph, we're like, well, that doesn't really explain why this is useful or what scenarios it's useful. We don't yet have that map of where is the places where you really want to use this. Mm -hmm. And so we wrote, uh, we actually wrote a test to generate this table, right? And you can see here, like, if I have two parameters in five variations, well, that's 25 combinations, and pairwise does nothing, right? But if I got, like, Yahtzee, so here I have five dice and with six options, that's 7,776 combinations, and I can get almost the same amount. It's not, it's, it's lossy, right? But I can get, like, 95% of the value if I just ask for give me the best 49 combinations, right? Or if I have nine by nine, that's like almost 400,000 and 130 specific ones of those will give me almost the same amount of test coverage, right? It wasn't until we created this that Lars and I actually understood the real value of what we were creating. So like writing the documentation made us understand our product. It wasn't just for other people. Like, and, and this has been something that shows up a lot with writing documentation is it's made 
me understand my product better. It made me understand my creation better. And it made my product and creation better. Yeah. So that's, that, that this is something I can relate to because I've been writing for 30 years now, <laughs> more, more yeah. than 30 years. And one thing that I noticed about writing is you can write in order to clarify your ideas. And it makes a lot of sense to, to be able to. Also, another thing that I find interesting is I've been very interested and in, I published a book on usable software design, which is fundamentally applying usability principles to software design. So to yeah. the way we structure our code. And uh, uh, there's one uh, characteristics that you, so when you think about usability, you think about five characteristics and one of them is learnability. So fundamentally, how fast can somebody who's completely new at the task do that? Task? Absolutely. And this is kind and of what you are optimizing, I think, with this approach. I, I mean, I think you're, optimizing is a strong word, but like, because there are usability skills, right? And and I'm not even gonna say like I'm good at those, but I wasn't even practicing being good at them before mm -hmm. I wrote the documentation, yeah. right? Now, at least I'm caring about them, right? Yeah. All right. So this has been uh, very interesting, <laughs> but I think it's time to get to yeah to a close. Uh, before we close, I have a couple more questions. One of them is, uh, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our audience that we didn't talk about? Um, so I don't think so. Um, I really would encourage like, uh, reach out, uh, connect, connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, if you're curious about these things, like set up a thing to pair or bring me in with your teams uh, to pair and mob with your teams. But uh, it doesn't have to be me, like connect with whoever, like just try to connect. In, in the time of the pandemic, it has been more important than ever to have that shared mental space. Um, so, so try it out, like open up your phone, do a call, share a screen, on your computer and share some code, like connect with people in your teams, connect with people uh, around the world. Like if you haven't heard that theme of connect with people, like <laughs> let me just say it again, like do it. That's a big thing. And kind of try things out. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, it's so, there's so much value there. Okay, so where can people find you? I know Twitter, LinkedIn, but something more specific. Twitter, uh, Twitch. Uh, so first of all, my name is Llewellyn Falco. That is a very internet unique name. Uh, so I'm easy to find with a Google search. Uh, Twitch, uh, uh, and I'm a Llewellyn Falco almost everywhere except for Git, because I, I signed up to Git too early before, um, before I realized that you should just use your name. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, Twitch, GitHub, YouTube, I have a lot of videos on YouTube. You can uh, search there and go through those things. Uh, my blog, uh, and just, you know, tweet at me, link, LinkedIn me, email me. Um, okay. All right, and the last question, which is a question that I like to ask to all our guests is, um, when I started programming, and presumably when you started programming as well, when I started programming, I my choice was fundamentally between C++ and Visual Basic. Those were kind of yeah. the, the things that were there at that point in time. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you, you kind of could do uh, for, for work. But today, it's much more complex than that. You have JavaScript, yeah. you have Python, you have .NET, you have Java, you have all these technologies and so on, and it can be quite overwhelming for junior developers and for, yeah. for people who are new in their career in the sense that they've done this perhaps three to five years, something like that, where they are just starting. So then one thing that I like to ask is thinking about these types of people, what is some advice that you could give them? 
So uh, a couple of pieces of advice. The first is like practice. Just, I mean, just in general, practice. Uh, find some katas, find some, like just do things that you're gonna throw away where you can learn stuff. I was, I was reading a design blog the other day and they were talking about katas and for design katas. And I was like, oh, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. Why don't I do that? And one of the things they were saying was learn your tools. Like in your kata, try to take like, what are the, the commands I do normally and find the shortcuts for your tools. And I was like, you know, like, so for example, for me, a design tool I use a lot is PowerPoint, right? Um, I A, do a lot of presentations, so I'm doing stuff there, but then I also, I, I find myself in PowerPoint a lot of times just doing graphics. Uh, like it's just an easy tool to sketch something up in. And I was like, you know what? I don't know most of the shortcuts in PowerPoint. Like I don't know my tooling as well as I should. Um, any program that you use a lot, and that definitely goes for your IDE. Like it is shocking to me how, how powerful IDEs are nowadays and how badly they are used by most programmers, right? Learn your your IDE shortcuts. Uh, like for example, if you are in Visual Code, which is not something I suggest in general, right? Because there are much more powerful IDEs. Uh, but this also is true if you're in any of the JetBrain projects. Uh, there's a shortcut for select next. So a lot of times they'll be like, I need to select these this thing five places and then change all of them. Learn that shortcut. It's really powerful. It's really powerful. Um, Learn, learn your shortcuts. Do, do katas, learn your shortcuts. Do katas, learn new techniques. Like, practice. And if you don't have anybody, practice alone. But practice is much better if you do it with somebody. Right? Like, practice with someone. A, it will make it so that you do it regularly. Right? If you practice with somebody and set up the next time you're going to practice when you're done, You'll be surprised at you know end of a couple months what will occur. Um, if you say I want to practice, in the end of a couple months you're like, oh, I should have started practicing. Like <laughs> that's how that works. Like good intentions just die, right? If if you just try to do them by yourself, but if you do them with someone else, and those things will practice and practice with somebody. That's my best advice. All right, Lou. Thanks a lot for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, I always like having these long conversations because we we meet but we often don't have the time to sit down and kind of go into <laughs> what brought us here. And I, I look forward to being able to see you in person again. Yeah, that will be really, really nice. So thank you a lot for your time and for your insights. And... Uh, for our audience, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Uh, we yes. we have done this for one year now, <laughs> or more than one year, and it's been uh, it's been the first year of YouTube for us. It's been very very interesting. Uh, I like to thank everybody who subscribed in the meantime, who watched our videos. Um, we will take a break from this kind of videos until the beginning of next year because it's still. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we we need also need to take some holidays, uh, but I'd like to thank you all for watching. Uh, subs just to remember, we need to pay our dues to the algorithm. So subscribe, uh, make sure that you um, click the notification button and all that. Comment, like, whatever you uh, you found interesting about these uh, conversations, and thank you all for for participating, for listening, and until next time, I'd like to remember you to think, design, and work smart. Bye.